Good morning, Daybreak. I am so happy to be here. I love coming out west. West, coming out west. Uh, just made that up. Um, I, I love this community. I, I love this church. But before I start, I have to apologize. I, I heard you guys are getting snow this week. My fault. I took, I took my snow brush out of my truck last week. I know that was a little premature, but it's my fault, and I apologize. So, but before I, not before I get started, because I've already started. But uh, what I want to talk about today is Wes gave me an equation, and they're going to put it up here on the screen, an equation. And what, what's interesting about this equation is it identifies, it, it signifies Hope Water International uh, uh, directly what we do. Clean water plus Jesus equals transform life. But before I talk about that, before I talk about how Hope Water does that, uh, I want to talk about how we make that formula very complex. One of the things we tend to do is we tend to make that difficult, kind of like, kind of like new math, like that equation, we, new math. How many, how many are doing new math? Is it called common core math, is that what it's called? You know, my first question when I think of new math is, is, is was old math like not working? Uh, because I don't really understand the new, it's almost like, like if I had to give you an analogy, like my, my son-in-law is here, like Seth, if Seth came to my front door and Seth knocked on the front door and said, hey, can I come in? I'm like, oh, Seth, can, can you get, go around the back door? And Seth would be like, well, well, why? Why can't I use your front door? Does it not work? I'm like, no, no, my front door works. I use the front door. Everybody uses the front door, but the new way to get into my house is to go around the back door, climb over the fence, through the bush, through the back window, and meet me right back here. That's new math to me, right? But the the challenge is, is when we make that formula, when we make that formula complex, what you see after the equal sign doesn't happen. We don't experience that life transformation, and we remain thirsty. And when I talk about thirsty, I don't mean this type of thirsty. I don't mean a dehydration type of thirsty, even though I just read a stat this morning that 75% of Americans are always dehydrated, which I didn't know that. So that means this side of the room is actually um, needs a drink of water, and this side of the room has to go to the bathroom, something like that. <laughs> that's what that means. But that's not the, that's not the type of, uh, of thirsty I'm talking about today. I guess there's an urban definition of thirsty, and I just started hearing about it a couple weeks ago as I'm studying uh, what I want to talk about today, but it's been around for a while, and it originally came out, thirsty was more of if a guy was chasing a girl or a girl was chasing a guy, and they, they would say they were thirsty if they were desperately or relentlessly searching for a guy or girl, but it's changed over the years, and, and, and now it means, it means a, like a relentless or a desperate search for something. Whether that's, a, whether that's a search for uh, like affirmation or whether that's a search for purpose or even meeting. It's this relentless search for something. And that's the type of thirsty I want to talk about today. And I'm going to do it with a story that you have heard many times and I've heard many times. It's John 4. It's the woman at the well. But as I was reading this story, uh, three things popped out to me that will continue to make you thirsty. It will make that, that math formula complex. So I'm going to jump right into it because I have a lot to talk about today and I don't want to go over my time. And we're going to jump right to John 4 in the first verse, first and second verse, where, where where he says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples. I'm going to stop there for a second. Have you ever thought, this, this could actually be the first, uh, you know, example of fake news, right? They thought Jesus was baptizing and he really wasn't. But have you ever, have you ever had something happen to you and you thought it was Jesus and later you realized it wasn't? I mean, for me, just recently, you know, I, I run a lot because I do this Hope Water thing and in December, I, I ran too many miles. So up came January and I started running and I started feeling pain in my hip. So just so you know, I give great running advice, but I'm horrible at following my advice. So just so you know that. So my, pain, my hip started hurting and so what I did is I took some ibuprofen and kept running. Well, the next time I ran, it hurt some more, so I took some more ibuprofen, and I kept running. And the next time it hurt, I took more ibuprofen, and I kept running, and eventually I fractured my hip. And you know what the first thing I did was? Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, what are you trying to teach me by fracturing my hip? You know, I I do that, because I think, you know, Jesus actually caused the fracture of my hip, and sometimes God says, you know what, it wasn't me. It was kind of your stupidity, right? (laughs) Right? I mean, Jesus had my, my check body engine light on, and I just kept running, Right? But 
that's not one of my three points, but I just thought it was interesting that they thought Jesus was doing the baptizing. Because wouldn't, be, wouldn't that be interesting if he was, the competitiveness of that? Like if Wes said, I got, I got baptized by Peter, and I said, well, Wes, I got baptized by Jesus, right? So, but let's, let's go on. We're going to go right to, to verse 3, where he, Jesus, left Judea, Ju- Ju- Judea and departed again for Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. That's an interesting part because it says he needed to go through Samaria. I think we have a map I'm going to show. It was not normal. It was not normal for a Jew to go through Samaria. They would actually take the extra time, and you've heard the story, they would go around Samaria because the Jews wanted to avoid the Samaritans. They wanted to avoid them because the Samaritans represented some kind of division or resentment. Actually, I think they thought like the Samaritans had cooties. But Jesus, Jesus actually needed to go through Samaria. God needed him to go through Samaria. And uh, kind of a play on words, and I heard somebody else say this before, so I didn't make this up, but rather than Samaria, some area, is there some area, is there some area in your life that God is pressing you to walk through that you keep avoiding? You know, it could be a, a relationship that you need to mend, or maybe some forgiveness that you need to give, or it could be a conversation you need to have, or a bad habit that you need to break, or a thought process that you need to stop. But the question is, is there some area, is there a Samaria in your life that Jesus is asking you to walk through that you're avoiding? And we're going to talk about how you don't make hope water your Samaria later. But uh, it, and it's always difficult for me personally when I'm trying to figure out, is it Jesus or is it something else? Is it really Jesus asking me to go through this some area or is it something else? And I know there's a lot of ways to figure it out, but I think it really boils, boils down to three questions you need to ask yourself. The first is, when you're trying to decide if this some area is something I should walk into or I should lean into, you've got to fact check it. And I don't mean with Fox News or CNN. I mean fact check it with this, right? Fact check it. Nothing Jesus is going to lead you into, no some area Jesus is going to lead you into will ever contradict this, right? Jesus is never going to ask you to do something that's going to separate yourself from him and his fellowship, so first is make sure it doesn't contradict scripture. The second is typically when, when Jesus is asking us or God is asking us to step into some area, it's typically something we can't handle on our own, right? You know, you've heard the phrase that God won't give you anything you can't handle. We all know that's not true. God will give us things that we can't handle because he wants us to rely on him. The only way God can show us he's in control, right, is to, to make sure we're out of control sometimes. Right? We have no control. So the first is make sure it doesn't contradict scripture. The second is, you know, you know make sure that, uh, make sure that it, it's, it's a dependency on him. The third is you, want, you sometimes want to get confirmation from people that are spiritually grounded. And uh, I'm going to give an example I gave a couple years ago, and I'm going to give it again because four years ago, uh, I came here to, to, to talk to Wes about Hope Water International and should we do it? And that was my Samaria, to be honest. I kept trying to get around it and go around it. I'm like, God, I know you're telling me to, to walk through this some area, but I'm not going to do it. And I was talking to Wes about it, and I kind of explained it to him. And he just very bluntly, very boldly said, just do it. I'm like, ah, Wes, and I had every excuse why to walk around Samaria. And Wes said, no. Not only did he say, just do it, he said, on March 26th, and I remember the date, you're going to launch it from my stage. I'm like, wow, hold on, Wes, slow down. But the, the point is, is you know, I consider Wes spiritually grounded, and sometimes you've got to have people confirm that in you. You have to have people confirm that in you that, that you trust. And the interesting thing, Wes, I'm here to kind of announce this today, is since that day, four years ago, it was January of 2017, since that day you said that to me, and you said, hey, you should launch this. We're putting in our 100th well next week. 100th well. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's 85,000 people, clean water in Jesus, because you said, hey, walk through that Samaria. So my first point that's going to keep you thirsty, when I, when I say thirsty, again, the urban definition, a relentless pursuit of something or relentlessly searching for something, you're going to remain thirsty if you don't walk through that Samaria that God's asking you to walk through. That's number one. Number two, uh, let's continue the story and go to verse number five. So he came to a city called city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, Jesus was tired, so it's okay for us to be tired sometimes, sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. If we jump to the seventh verse, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. 
for, for his disciples has gone away in, into the city to buy food. So if you jump back a little bit, the sixth hour actually means noon. So this woman was purposely coming to the well, the hottest part of the day. Normally women would go and get water at this well in the morning. What was cool it was actually a, it was actually a social highlight of their day to actually go and, and, and converse and collect water. But this woman purposely was going when nobody else was there. She did not want to be seen. And the interesting thing is Jesus says to her, give me a drink. That's interesting because as we know, G- Jesus didn't need her help to get a drink. But he asked her to give him a drink. And Jesus was intentionally placed himself in need of what she could offer. There's this quote by, his name is D.T. Niles. He's a great theologian. And he says, Jesus was a true servant because he was, he was at the mercy of those he came to serve. Jesus was always serving. So when he saw that woman at the well, the first thing he did is he, he wanted to serve her by asking her for a drink. What he was doing by asking her for water, he was affirming her. He was affirming her dignity. He was actually blessing her. Because I think we all know this, and I struggle with this, that when we ask somebody for help, we ask somebody for help, we're actually valuing that person, saying we value you. And I struggle with that, and that's one of my weaknesses. But this was not normal for Jesus to do this, for any person to do this. So, of course, the woman gets confused. And if you go to verse 9, and she starts to push back a little bit, it says, the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? So the fact that she was a woman, the fact that she was a Samaritan, because remember, the Samaritans and Jews didn't like each other. So she was, she was saying, why? Why would you ask me? And many times when, when, when we hear God speaking to us or when I hear God speaking to me, we get really theoretical and we don't want to address specifically what God is saying. And, and that, women, that woman is basically saying, I know you're not talking to me. I just know you're not talking to me. And, and I think we all go through that phase where we, we hear God talking to us. We hear God saying, hey, you need to do this. But we say, you can't be ta- talking to me. I bet some of you sit here and listen to Wes preach, and you're probably elbowing your husband or wife saying, I know he's talking to you. He's not talking to me. And we do that often. But many times when, when God is trying to speak to us and God's trying to push us in some direction, um, we don't think he's talking to us because we're stuck. We're stuck. Sometimes we're stuck in, in a pattern or we're just stuck in a way of thinking or we're stuck in a story. This woman was stuck in a story in her head. She had a story of her past and, and that she was stuck in that. And sometimes when we get stuck in that story, that we tend to not respond to what God's asking us to do. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, we get the story in our mind, like I'm not good enough or I don't deserve that or if you only knew my past. But what God is saying is that I'm so much bigger than your story. He was telling that woman, I'm so much bigger than your story. And, and because sometimes st- uh, stuck is a state of mind. It's like Orlando is a great city, but I'm not supposed to be in Orlando, right? Sometimes we're stuck in not where we're at today, but where we're supposed to be. Do you ever get stuck in supposed to be? Like my, my, my child was supposed to get into that college. Or I was supposed to still be married. Or actually I was supposed to be, be married by now. Or maybe I was supposed to have a job by now. I wasn't supposed to lose my job. You know, we get stuck in supposed to be. What about I'm, I was supposed to be healed by now? I think some of us might be stuck in that. But you know, when we were, when I left college, I, I moved down to Dallas and I spent 10 years in Dallas and that's where I met my wife. And after we had been there 10 years, we were actually moving back to Michigan. And uh, we, we rented a big U-Haul. And I was, pulling, I was driving the U-Haul and pulling the car behind the U-Haul. My wife was driving her car behind me. And she had my daughter in the car. And she was pregnant with our son, Bryson. And we had our dog, I think, in the car, too. And we're driving back from Dallas, moving back to Michigan. And I had been away from uh, Michigan for 10 years, so I forgot about snow. And we were moving, and we were moving in March. And we get to, I think it was southern Indiana, something like that. We wanted to take a break. And again, I forgot about the snow thing. And, and it wasn't snow there, but I had forgotten that the snow probably just melted. And we pull in this holiday in, and, and I got this big U-Haul pulling my car. I'm trying to drive. And I got to turn the thing around because there's no way I could back that thing up in the morning. But the parking lot was too small. So I see this field that I can turn my U-Haul around in. Yeah, because again, I for, forgot that snow thaws and it makes the ground soft. So I pulled into this field, and as you expected, the U-Haw sunk. And it sunk into really deep mud, almost to the point where we couldn't even see the back tire. It was so deep. 
And we paid a lot of money for somebody to come at 2 o'clock in the morning to pull that truck out. Uh, but the point is, is sometimes when we're stuck, we're stuck in something really deep. We're stuck in re- something really deep be- because God, God, God does stuff in our lives when we're stuck. And, and, and as, we, as we start to push through, as we start to push through, we get stronger. It's kind of like, Wes, how, how much can you bench press? 450. Wes, no, nobody will know. I'll just say it. Wes can bench 450. But everyone know what bench pressing is when you're, when you're on a bench and you kind of lay down and you kind of press forward? And when you're bench pressing, it's always good to have a spotter, right? Somebody that can actually spot you. And do you ever have those that work out when, when, when you're bench pressing and, and, you, and you, you're starting to push up and you just start to get stuck? That spotter yanks the weight off of you, right? All right, that's a bad spotter, right? Well, that's also a bad God. For God not to ever give us any weight or give us any challenge, then we're never going to grow our faith. We're never going to grow our faith. When you're on that 10th rep and you're really trying to push and you get stuck, God is standing over you saying, over you saying I am not going to take this off of you, but I am going to give you a little lift. I'm going to give you a little lift. And sometimes we all need a little lift, don't we? And I'm going to tell you a quick story about a, a girl named Karen. Is Karen here today? There she is. There's Karen. Okay. Karen's here today. I'm, I'm going to tell you Karen's story. I'm going to have to read some of it because I want to make sure I get it right because she said some great things. And actually, I talked to her on the phone two nights ago. I'm like, man, if I would have known that, she should have been up here talking, not me, based on what she said. But, but Karen is new to Daybreak. I think this is only her second or third time coming here. But about a year ago, uh, Karen was new to the Hope Water team. Uh, but prior to that, uh, what Karen, and I'm, Karen, this is her word, she says she was in a faith crisis, right, Karen? Where she had lost her aunt, she had lost her dad, and she was mad at God. She was mad at God. She was angry at God. She would go to church, right? But she wasn't listening. She said she was on her phone the whole time. Not here, Wes. Not daybreak. Everyone here listens, just you know, right? It wasn't daybreak. She's listening now. I see her. But she said she wouldn't even listen. She'd, she'd be on her phone the entire time. She was stuck. And then the pandemic hit. And, and Karen says that her faith, her stress, her anxiety, her depression deepened. And, and she had a, had a cousin that was on the Hope Water team that kept inviting her in to, 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 to join Hope Water, but that was Karen's Samaria, right? You were avoiding it. Like, no, I can't do that. But when the pandemic hit, she didn't have much else to do, so she started walking. She started walking 20 minutes at a time, but, but she had said that once she started walking, she started talking to God, or more so, you started listening to God. And she felt like her heart was starting to heal. And then came time to really jump into Hope Water. Last year, we had to start on Zoom because we couldn't meet in person. So she was getting ready to attend her, vers- her first Zoom call with the Hope Water team. And this is Karen's thought process, right, Ron, right before she was going to log on and talk to you all. Her thought process was, why would they, th- and this is her saying it, not me, why would they think, what would they think of this out of shape 40-year-old woman who had never completed a race? What are they going to think of me when I join this first Zoom call? Karen was stuck, wasn't she? She was stuck. She was stuck in, in the stuff that was going on in her mind. She was stuck in a story. But what she says was that the more she Zoomed, the more she came to group training eventually when it went in person. She said the team encouraged her so much. Her exact words are, they believed in me so much that I started to believe in myself. Right, Karen? Karen was getting a little lift. She was getting a little lift from the team. And eventually she lost some weight, she grew stronger, and Karen completed her first half marathon last year, right? She's got her medal, she's got her medal. Now I told Karen when we talked a couple days ago that she feels like she's getting unstuck. But I told her, be careful, because now the enemy's gonna come after you, right? So just be careful. And the point is, is you need a community, a, a, a Hope Water type community or a Daybreak type, type community to, to keep you going. So that's point number two is you're always going to stay thirsty if you stay stuck. So you've got to do what you can to get unstuck. All right, let's keep going. I've got a few more points, and then we're going to jump to Hope Water. So verse number 10, Jesus answered, her, answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So Jesus now is giving uh, this, this woman a solution to whatever she's stuck in. He's telling her, you need living water. You need Jesus. You need God. He's telling her how to get unstuck. You know, he's explained her very clearly that 
that she needs living water. He's not, he's not trying to, to get something from her. He's trying to release something to her. That's what he's trying to do. But as the woman d- is doing now, and that I do often as we push back again, don't we? God, again, has given us a bridge to cross, and we're like, there's no chance. I'm not crossing that. I'm still stuck. You can't be talking to me. And if you go to verse number 11, the woman says to him, but sir, you have nothing to draw with. Basically, you don't have a bucket, and the, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You are, greater than our, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it itse- himself? as well as his sons and his livestock. Jesus is trying to build that bridge, and the woman is pushing back again. She's saying, no, you can't be talking to me. You don't even have a bucket. All she could think about was this. She said, you don't have a bucket. The challenge is, and this is point number three, is it's not about the bucket. Jesus is saying, it's not about the bucket. I'm not happy. I don't have peace. I'm not satisfied. So what do we do? Maybe we get a different bucket, right? A different bucket. Maybe we get this bucket, right? Maybe we fill this bucket. Maybe if I move, if I move somewhere, then I'll be satisfied. But then we, fig- then we figure out this bucket doesn't fill us up. So maybe we get this bucket. I call this bucket the pleasure bucket, if you can see it. Maybe if I just have fun, right? If I just have fun, then I'll be satisfied. But that doesn't fill us up. Or maybe this bucket. I call it the bigger bucket. Bigger, 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 right? A bigger house, a bigger car. Then I'll be happy, right? Then I'll be satisfied to have a bigger bucket. Actually, I've filled this bucket up many times myself because I like big buckets and I cannot lie, right? <laughs> if, you're, if you're under 30, you're not going to get that joke. All right. Or what about this bucket? I call this a new look bucket. If I just get a new look, if I get a new look, then I'll be satisfied, right? And we fill that bucket up. That doesn't fill us up. Or maybe, maybe I'll downsize my bucket, right? I'll minimize. I'll downsize my bucket. Or maybe this bucket. This bucket's going to fill me up, right? Or this, right? Waking up every morning, you know, how many likes did I get? Did they comment on my post? We think that this is going to, and it might temporarily fill us up. But what God is saying is, if you drink from these wells, you're always going to be thirsty. You're always going to be thirsty. And I know what you might be saying is, I don't go on Facebook, you, maybe you don't, but, but why do you go shopping when you don't have money? Why do you put pressure on your kids to do something that, that you never did? I think everyone has a bucket they're trying to fill, correct? And I got a couple more buckets. What's this bucket? Oh, this is, I'm going to get a new wife bucket or a new husband bucket, right? That's going to make me happy. And the last one, one more bucket, is this bucket. This bucket's going to fill us up, right? You know, I grew up with uh, six brothers and sisters. We had seven kids. And I think there's a picture that I'm a little embarrassed about, so I won't turn around and look at it. But there is a picture of, of my, my brothers and sisters. And the interesting thing is, is my wife had, or my wife, my mom had uh, my oldest sister. When, she was, well, when my oldest sister was 10, my, my mom had my youngest brother. What I'm trying to say with all that is we had seven kids under the age of 10 in our house with one bathroom. But my mom and dad, they really wanted to send us to a Catholic school. So all seven of us went to a Catholic school from grade 1 to 12, which how they afforded that, I don't know. We had a lot of love in our house, but my mom was a part-time secretary. She couldn't afford daycare for all those kids. And my dad was a bus driver. How they afforded to send us all to Catholic school, I don't know. But the, the interesting thing is, is going to a Catholic school where you actually have to pay to go, you know, I grew up thinking, man, I wish I had those shoes. I wish I had that bike. And then when I got in the working world, this was the significance I was chasing. I was chasing this. I was thinking, man, if I could just make that much money, then I'll be satisfied. And I think we have another picture here of God eventually saying to me, here, take it. That's, that's actually at 37, I became CEO of a global company. I had this. My bucket was full. Actually, it was overflowing. It wasn't just full. That's actually a picture of, uh, we were in Germany at the time, and I flew back and forth to Europe quite a bit. And in the summer, my family would come over and stay with us. And we wanted to head over to Venice for a weekend because it was an hour flight for my birthday. And the owner of our company said, hey, if you're going to Venice, just use the company plane. This bucket was full. This bucket was full. This bucket was actually overflowing. But you know what the challenge was? The challenge was I was still thirsty. 
very thirsty. That picture, I remember taking that picture. I was thirsty. My wife knows I was thirsty. My daughter's here. I think I made our, she was a teenager at the time. I made our relationship difficult because I was thirsty. The point is, and I didn't really start understanding significance until Hope Water. Because just shortly after that, we started Hope Water. And once you start tasting the significance of something like Hope Water, you know, this no longer matters. But one thing I do want to say is I'm not saying, I'm not saying you need to leave your job. You need to quit your job and move to Africa to figure out what God wants to do with you. Because Steve Norman, I think some of you know, he's preached here before. You know, he reminded me of the Peter story of, of stepping out of the boat. And I used to always say to him, but Steve, I, you know, I, I can't go back in the working world. I stepped out of the boat. I, I started Hope Water. And he said to me, no, you're, you're listening to that story. You're, you're, you're remembering that story wrong. He said, sometimes God will ask you to step out of the boat, make you a different person, and send you back to the boat to be a different person. So the point is, none of, this, none of these buckets, none of these buckets are sins. None of, these bucket, none of these buckets are wrong. Just don't ever expect to find joy or peace or fulfillment in these. And, and, and God confirms it. If you go to verse number, where are we at here? Let's go down. Verse number 13. Jesus said to her, whoever drinks of this water, of this water, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up in everlasting life. So point number three is, you'll always be thirsty if you make it about the buckets. If you make it about the buckets. What Jesus was saying was, I want to give you something that doesn't depend on your bank account. I want to give you something that won't diminish based on your biopsy results. I want to give you something that's going to make you stronger in your struggle. And finally, the woman says, I think you're onto something. I think you're onto something. In verse 15, the woman says, Sir, give me this water that I, I may not thirst, nor come here to draw water again. The woman's now convinced. She says, If there are some kind of free refills, then sign me up, right? Sign me up. So I don't have to keep coming back to this well. So I don't have to keep checking for likes. So I don't have to keep performing. That is why Jesus asked her for water. Not because he was thirsty, because she was thirsty. I'm going to skip over a few verses where where Jesus asked her to go get her husband, and she says, I don't have one. He says, I know, I know all about you. Because there's a couple more quick points I want to make. If you would jump to verse 28, uh, it says, The woman left her her, her water pot. She left her bucket. Went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be Christ? Then they went out to the city and came to him. Don't you find it interesting that she left her bucket? The only purpose of her coming to that well was to fill that bucket. She left it. She ran away and left her bucket. I don't know, it means a lot of different things, and I've read a lot of different things that it could mean. But I actually think that the woman found a bigger purpose in her life. And she said, this is her past. That bucket was her past, and she left her past behind. Because I think, I think when we determine what God really wants to do with each one of us, we're going to leave a lot of stuff behind too, aren't we? And I think that's what, what was happening in that story. But the other question I had, and I asked my friend Steve Norman this, like, why, why, did, why did they believe her? She was an outcast. I mean, why would they even believe her? But she, you know, if part of the story is she historically would always go places where nobody was. So she was always isolated. So for her to come running towards the people and and saying, hey, let me tell you what this guy just told me. I think people had to take notice. I think when Jesus transforms your life, people can't help but take notice. I think Jesus confirms this. Actually, I know Jesus confirms this in verse 39. It's the last verse. He says, and many Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman that testified. He told me all that I did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. You're never going to be thirsty if you make it about living water, if you accept the living water. The woman's life was transformed. Her entire community was transformed. And 
That's the same thing that can happen to each one of us when we accept the living water. We can not only transform our own life, but we can transform the people around us, whether it's our coworkers, our neighborhood, our family, our communities, people over in Africa. So I'm going to jump now to Hope Water. So you might be asking, what, is, what does all this have to do with Hope Water? My answer is everything, everything. And the reason is, is Hope Water's goal is not to finish a half or full marathon. That's the bucket. That's the bucket. What Hope Water wants to do is Hope Water wants to give you and give people in, Af- in Africa an opportunity to, to taste living water. We want to give you an opportunity to transform your life. We want to give you the, the opportunity to never be thirsty. And we're going to watch a, a short video uh, on Hope Water, and then we'll come back up and kind of give you a, a, few, a few action steps. In the scripture, Jesus says, love your neighbor. Your neighbor is actually the person that does live next door, the person that's similar to you, but it's also the foreigner. I never really got the connection as far as the importance of water until a trip I took five or six years ago now to Kenya, and we were gonna follow a couple women and follow them as they did their daily hike to a water source. I think I was in shock most of the time because first, to understand that there's people that live in our world that do not have access to clean water. Because we can get up in the middle of the night and walk 10 feet to our bathroom and get water. We can go downstairs and get clean water. And the second thing that blew me away was the water that they were walking to get. You wouldn't even let your dog get in this water. And it was the filthiest stuff that you've ever seen. One of the things that we really believe with Hope Water International is this idea that we want not to just bring water to people and meet their physical need, but there's also a spiritual need as well. And so one of the things that we really want to do is to give people the opportunity to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a lot of times we see that happening by meeting their physical need. Water comes to their village and you will hear people say that that aren't even believers, that God must actually care about us. This is what makes us very unique with Hope Water International. We draw a line in the sand and say, there's a lot of people in the water space, but we believe that there's more. We believe that people are wanting more, are looking for joy and looking for something else. And so the water is kind of our way into a community to help out with education, to bring clinical care, orphan care. I believe people want to have a significant life. They want to have a life of purpose. And they see this and they're like, man, that is incredible what you're doing. And I'm like, man, it's not just me. This is thousands of people that are engaged in this. And they wake up to the fact like, what am I doing with my life? And so to get to that place to say, what is my calling? What what is my purpose? What is the hope that drives me? This is the question that Hope Water answers. How do you know if love is real? To me, it has to cost you something. People think I'm crazy. Every day, I get up, I push myself, I dig deeper, I go farther for someone I may never meet. So why do I do it? To bring water, to bring life, to bring hope. Significance, not success. That's what we can, that's what hope water can bring you. It can help you walk through that some area that God's pushing you to walk through. It can help you get unstuck. And we can definitely help you not make it about the buckets. That's what hope water can do for you. And we want you to be a part of it. So you all have cards uh, that w- were handed out to you. I encourage you to fill, even if God's nudging you, don't make that card your Samaria. I'm warning you. Don't make it your Samaria. Don't, don't avoid something if God's nudging you to go in that direction. Fill out that card. Turn it in at the back. Uh, we have, we're going to have Hope Water people at the back at flags and outside at tables. If you have questions, you can talk to them. But uh, I really hope that, uh, that you actually uh, jump in.
Because again, God can do amazing things through you to not only trans- make that equation really simple, to not only transform your life, but to, to transform lives all across the world. So I'm gonna bring the team up. So anyone on Hope Water, we want you to come up because uh, we want Wes to come up too and we want to pray over you. So if you're part of Hope Water, if you think you're part of Hope Water, if you want to be a part of Hope Water, come on up and Wes is going to kind of kind of kind of close us out and and uh pray for us. Bill, I couldn't help from watching uh, the well behind you. And I've seen that well in many different villages. And it does represent hope. And the message you just gave today, I think, made it so clear what it's all about. And I want to thank you on behalf of the church for the challenge that you've made to all of us. Let's thank him one more time. Thanks, Wes. And, of course, we know, Bill, who does all the work, right? Yeah. Yeah. These are the ones that are out there running by my house on Saturdays, running down Baldwin, running down various streets here in our community, preparing Johnson Park and so forth. Thank you. I see you as missionaries, every one of you. And this church loves you. And just to think how many wells you've already put in and how many more we're going to put in. So let's take a moment and pray right now. I think I'll ask all of you to stand. Let's just all stand together. Lord Jesus, we come to you today and we thank you for the message, the challenge we just heard from Bill. My heart has been challenged. It's been moved. I want to thank you, Lord, for the many wells that have gone in all over Africa, and yet we know that that is just a drop in the bucket. We know, God, that there are many more villages, literally hundreds if not thousands of villages that need this hope that Bill was talking about. Not only fresh and clean water, but the hope of Jesus. And I just pray, God, that as we uh, look at this new season and we get ready to pound the pavement, so to speak, to prepare and to raise the necessary funds, that you will use every one of these team members that are behind me today Lord, I pray that you would protect their bodies, protect their hearts, their soul. May we remember the message that Bill just gave to us about what bucket are we focused on today. May we know our purpose and be reminded of it time and time and time again. And now, Lord, as we uh, go from this service into the rest of the day, may we not just walk away and just say, well... That was a good message, but may we walk away with a new challenge and a new burden in our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming today. Don't forget, there's a greet and meet with Jeff and Ariana Eckert in the lounge. I want you to go by. Also, turn in your card. Make sure you turn in your card as you walk out today. And again, let's give it up for this team that's behind me. Thank you all. Thank you online. Thank you for watching today. God bless you.